Tonight's show is about time, with a look back to the beginning of the buzz, then a look forward to NAB and beyond. We start with Steve Martin, the CEO of Ripple Training. Steve co-founded the buzz with Ron Margolis in September of 2000. When Steve and Ron began the buzz, there was only one other podcast on the web. Joining Steve is Philip Hodgetts, the CEO of Intelligent Assistance, who took over the buzz from Steve. Tonight, both Philip and Steve share their memories of the early days of podcasting. Next, we look forward to NAB 2016. NAB is less than three weeks away. So tonight, we've assembled an all-star team to predict what the hot news is going to be. Philip Hodgetts, the CEO of Intelligent Assistance. Michael Thomas, the Director of Technology at Keycode Media. Randy Altman, the Editor-in-Chief of PostPerspective.com. And Ned Soltz, the Contributing Editor for Creative Planet Networks. Next, tonight marks a transition for the buzz to new owners and a new format. Before we make the transition, though, we want to spend time talking with Serena Catania, the supervising producer for The Buzz, and take a look back at the last nine years of the program. All this plus a Buzz flashback and Randy Altman's perspective on the news. The Buzz starts now. Digital Production Buzz is brought to you by Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com and by ImagineProducts.com, the workflow experts. Since the dawn of digital filmmaking. Authoritative. One show serves a worldwide network of media professionals. Current. Uniting industry experts. Production. Filmmakers. Post-production. And content creators around the planet. Distribution. From the media capital of the world in Los Angeles, California, the digital production buzz goes live now. And welcome to the Digital Production Buzz, the world's longest-running podcast for the creative content industry, covering media production, post-production, and marketing around the world. Mike, tonight's show is all... Mike, stop typing. This is your aunt, Mike. I'm, I'm, I'm interacting with the community. You're what? I am. I'm interacting with the community. I didn't even know you could spell interacting. I did. I did. Well, I didn't come out right. It's just did you, interacting with the community. Did you know that NAB is less than three weeks away? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. So what's happening if with... If my face looks a little stressed, if my hair is a little whiter, it is because it is less than three weeks to go. So uh, what's happening with Supermate? Okay. Well, actually, today we have some announcements. We haven't actually made them, so I'm going to make them right here. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of talk about VR and 360 video. I know we've covered a little bit on the buzz before, but we're going to cover it a lot at the Super Meet. We just booked Ted Shilowitz as our ringmaster for the uh, three uh, VR and 360 video portion of it. We have the Nokia Ozo camera, which if you look that up, it's like a really groovy camera. And we're going to have audio and we're going to have editing. So we're going to take all those elements together and 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 see if we can do some compelling it's not just super meat, it's VR Stories in VR. It's going to be great. You know, that's what we're going to try to do. It's going to be fun. It is going to be I don't fun. think it's possible. I think it's going to be I don't think, well, I know you wreck, don't think it's possible, but, but I think we're going to try. <laughs> okay. And that's super meat where? At the Rio Hotel on Tuesday, April 19th. And honestly, if you uh, haven't got your tickets and you're going to NAB and you've never been to a super meet, buy them now because by the time the 19th comes around, there probably won't be any. I want to remind you as well to subscribe to our free weekly show newsletter at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Uh, look at every segment on the show and curated articles of special interest to filmmakers. And best of all, every issue is free. Mike and I will be back with Steve Martin and Philip Hodgetts right after Randy Altman's perspective on the news. This is Randy Altman's Perspective. Randy Altman has been writing about our industry for more than 20 years. In fact, she's the editor-in-chief of her own website, which is postperspective.com, and it gives me great pleasure to say hello, Randy. Welcome back. Hey, Larry. Glad to be back. Well, if your email is anything like mine, I'm getting 20 to 30 messages a day about what's coming up at NAB with vendors positioning themselves. Is there any news going on right now besides NAB? Not that I'm aware of. It's <laughs> drowning out pretty much everything else. So what's what's going on? What's happening around the show? Well, 
this has sort of been trending for the past few years, but before the show, the exhibit floor even begins, there is a lot going on in Vegas surrounding NAB. So it sort of starts off with Avid Connect. So they have their own little kind of trade show. And it's interesting from a press perspective because they used to announce their news right before the show began. Now it's sort of, they're doing it on Saturday morning. So they're getting a head start. So they sort of control that little trade show that's going on before NAB. But then there's also um, post and production world from you know the Future Media Concept guys, which is in affiliation with NAB. That's been going on for a few years. It's a lot of training, lots of post talk, lots of, of uh, networking. So that's been happening. This year, I'm sure you heard about it as well, but um, Ang Lee is going to address the crowd at the Future of Cinema Conference. So that's also, there's a lot of buzz surrounding that. So what's been interesting is, while NAB is still out there and popular, there has been this whole sort of world that has been built up around it, and an affiliation with NAB, but there's, there's a lot to learn. One of the things I've discovered is that it's impossible on Monday morning when all the press releases get announced for any vendor that's not absolutely the largest to get any kind of press attention at all. There's just so much going on that press announcements have started expanding to Sunday and then they've expanded to Saturday with Avid. And, and yeah. they're just trying to find a way to break through the noise to get their message out. And that's, that's and, and the other reason is we've got 100,000 people coming into NAB, so these other smaller conferences are using that draw to attract people to their conference, because otherwise people wouldn't show up. What's, exactly. What's been the most interesting email that you've gotten recently, pitching a product that's about to be announced? Well, I mean, obviously, HDR has been everywhere in my inbox, and people want me to come by and take a look at, at the solution that they're offering. So a lot of that and a lot of VR. I mean, the North Hall at NAB used to be um, audio companies and very quiet. I would, I would sort of cut through there on my way to any events that were happening at what used to be the Hilton. But now they have this whole VR section, and um, it's going to get a lot more, lot more feet into the North Hall. And they're all lumped together, which is great, because, you, you know, you could set aside an afternoon and just learn all you want. <laughs> all you want to know about VR could be done in, in one afternoon, thanks to the North Hall. Randy, what I want to do, we've got a segment a little bit later in the show where we're getting a bunch of us together to project what's going to happen at NAB. I want to bring you back for that section and get your thoughts on what we should expect in terms of themes and, and hot product areas at the show. Is that okay? Sounds great. In that case, thank you for joining us for right now. We'll bring you back in a few minutes. Randy Altman is the editor-in-chief of PostPerspective.com and a regular here on The Buzz. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Larry. To read more from Randy Altman, visit PostPerspective.com. Still to come on The Buzz. When you're working with media, one thing is essential. Your computer needs peak performance. However, when it comes to upgrading your Mac, there are so many different options to choose from that the process can be confusing. That's why Otherworld Computing carries the best upgrades that lets your computer performance and storage grow as your needs grow. Since 1988, OWC has become one of the most trusted names in quality hardware and comprehensive support to the worldwide computer industry. With an extensive online catalog of Mac, iPhone, and iPad enhancement products, as well as a dedicated team of knowledgeable experts providing first-rate tech support, OWC has everything you need to take your current system to the next level. Whether you need to maximize your system's memory, add blazing speed, or enhance reliability, look no further than the friendly experts at OWC. Learn more by visiting MacSales.com today. That's MacSales.com. Steve Martin is the creative force behind Ripple Training and has been using and teaching Final Cut Pro since 1999. He's a writer, producer, and filmmaker, and has consulted and or trained for Apple, Adobe, Disney, Canon, Sony Pictures, and other companies. But what makes him especially relevant for tonight 
is he co-founded The Buzz as DV Guys with Ron Margolis back in September of 2000. Hello, Steve. Welcome. Hi, Larry. Hey, thanks for having me on. Uh, it's my pleasure. By the way, I also need to say that joining us on set is Philip Hodgetts. Now, Philip masquerades as the CEO of Intelligent Assistance and Lumberjack System, but he's also involved with technology at virtually every area of digital production and post, and he also has run the buzz for years and years and years after Steve and before me. So we're going to take a look back in time at the very beginnings of podcasting. Philip, good to have you with us. Thank you. Steve, take us back to the early days of podcasting, way back to the year 2000. Back then, podcasting didn't even have a name, and there was only no. one other show on the web, which is Adam Curry's All Things Digital. Why did you and Ron decide to start the precursor of the buzz called DV Guys? Well, for one thing, we wanted to have a really cool sticker. You know, that we <laughs> <you know. laughs> So there's Ron and I. We have little caricatures of ourselves, and I still have stickers about this. But yeah, um, we wanted to do a show because, um, well, Final Cut Pro had just come out, and there was a lot of buzz about it, and a lot of people want to know information about it. So we really created the show to give people information about Final Cut. Um, Phil can speak more to that, but lots of, uh, you know, entrenched Avid editors, people that had, like, investments and, in, you know, thousands of dollars worth of, worth of gear want to know about, all about Final Cut. So really that was kind of the reason why it we brought it into being. Well, why... Just help me explain, because now today doing a podcast is easy. You click like two buttons and suddenly you're podcasting to billions. What was it like to create the very first podcast? What technology did you use and and did it work? Well, let's, um, since we're going back in history, and when we started the show, there was no such thing as podcasting. Sorry. It just it didn't exist. Podcasting didn't exist really until about 2005 when Apple decided to integrate it into 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 iTunes. It actually existed prior to that, but oh, yeah. Apple pretty much squashed all of the other companies that were doing development on podcasting. But bottom line is, 2005 is when it officially started. When we started the DB Guys show, you had to run OS X server, and you had to run this special software called QuickTime Streaming Server. Mm -hmm. It was a service on OS X. You had to uh, work with this software called QuickTime Broadcaster. You had to set it up. You had to broadcast your stream to the server. Then the server had to spit out all of the streams, and then you had to send people a link. And maybe they got the feed. Maybe they didn't. Um, it, was, problems. it was all... Audio, we did, we're talking like the height of the T1, which is 1.5 meters per second. Audio quality wasn't great, but it was really the first attempt at doing a radio show. Um, you could do video, but it really wasn't practical given the, the fact that we didn't have, um, you know, the, the technological infrastructure that we have today. Yeah, but, but it was all streaming. There was no podcasting. Steve, why? <laughs> why yeah. did you go to all this pain? But I used to get the stream because I listened to it all the time. Is that Mike Horton? Hi, Mike Horton. Good to hear, good to yeah, hear your Yeah, doesn't anybody ever tell you who's going to be on the show, Steve? <laughs> Hi, Steve. <laughs> Michael Horton here. <laughs> <laughs> he did say that. Hi, Mike. Good to, good to talk to you, too, Philip. Even though you're disembodied and I don't see I know, you. I'm just I know. I'm just a body. Yeah. Um, so why the trouble to answer your question? And I, I wrote it down. Here's why, Larry. It's really simple. Because it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It so, was cool. The fact we can broadcast over the internet a radio show. Are you kidding me? That was that was pretty neat. So, uh, what was a typical show? Well, I remember. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Well, we had a cool. You know what, Larry? We had a really good theme song, and I couldn't find it anywhere. But we had a DV Guys theme song that we'd always roll oh. in at the beginning. Does Philip? Do you remember it? Do you, yeah. Do you remember yeah. The I would. I'd still have it somewhere. But no, at uh, one of the appearances sure. that uh, Ron and Steve made at uh, early Lassie Pug meetings, because they made tons of appearances. I think on one of them they actually played the uh, the theme song. Because uh, and I remember <laughs> it, but I can't remember it. And I wish you. I wish you could find it. I, I wish I could too. I would. I would have rolled it in here, but yeah. I just couldn't find it. So. Was it was tell me what a typical show was because our show now runs an hour and the show could be any length you wanted. I'm sure yours was really short, like five oh, or six yeah. minutes. <laughs> it would run forever. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, I, I wrote this down. One of the challenges of doing a, a radio show is and I wrote it here. 
creating good content, finding good <laughs> guests, interviewing. It's like the same thing that the same thing that you have to go through every well, whatever month. Well, how often do you do these now? Every week, every month, every week, you, every week. Do you know how challenging it is to find you know content. Well, same challenges back then. We had to find you know we interviewed you know I don't know Boris Yaminsky from Boris. We you know the you know the product managers from Final Cut. Uh, you know. The guy who you know wrote the software for a QuickTime streaming server, whatever we needed, we got them on. But how you know, long a show was it? Um, the <laughs> show, I don't. Well, I don't. Philip can remember. It seemed like it was about thirty minutes. No, 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 it Steve, wasn't. It was like it two was hours. Like two hours. Oh, or two hours. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. You were, you were having so much fun. It seemed like thirty minutes. <laughs> okay. You're right. You're right, Philip. It was like. You're right. It was about two hours. <laughs> <laughs> you'd, you'd do a tutorial in there, a full, exactly. full length tutorial. You would have like a comedian call up every <laughs> once, every once in a while. Oh yeah. Was like, the, remember that comedian yeah, guy um, would call up and do like forty minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and you thought people wouldn't remember, Steve? I can hear it. Now. <laughs> I, I was guess I was trying to forget. It was. You're right. It was a longer show. So we had a lot of challenges. Philip, when did you take over the buzz? And was it the buzz when you took it over? It was just shortly after I moved uh, from Australia to the United States. Uh, Steve had already moved on to DV Creators, and uh, Ron Margolis, who was actually uh, my host at the time, saying he was, I was literally staying in his house, he said, would you like to come on and co-host the, the Digital Production Buzz now that there was a vacant co-host seat? And so I said, sure, why not? As long as I don't have to do those tutorials. Because <laughs> they were hard work. <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, Philip, correct me if I'm wrong, but you too had a sticker made, didn't you? Oh, yes, yes. Ron, Ron went back to the same artist and had the, the caricature done of me. Oh. <laughs> The caricature is so young. <laughs> <laughs> so who, was it you, Stephen, that started the show or Ron that started the show? Well, Ron, you know, I worked for Ron. So I, you know, I put the bug in his ear. I said, we should do a radio show. Um, that was at the height of Tupac, the, all this, you know, information about Final Cut. People were uh, voracious about Final Cut information back in 1999, 2000. And so I said, we should just do a rate. We should figure out how to do a radio show. And it was, and he goes, yeah, we should. <laughs> and we have, it was really that I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to set up a quick time OS 10. It was back then. It was called the Mac OS 10 server. Now it's just called OS 10, whatever. He set it up and he got it to work and we got through the technological hurdles and it was just my idea. And he just said, okay, that's great. Let's do it. So a lot of times Ron would just kind of, you know, run off by the seat of his pants. I, I want to do it and I just do it, you know, and that's what happened. He did it. <laughs> it. It wasn't quite as simple as it is now. I mean, in order to put that quick time broadcaster in place, it had to be in a co-located facility. It wasn't just sitting in the back room. It, it was a dedicated box in a facility yeah. that cost quite a lot of money to, to put in place. I mean, it's, thank you, know, thankfully, it, Ron had deep pockets. But it's still hard. It's still hard to, to broadcast live oh. and stream. It's still really hard. It shouldn't be as hard. It's a lot easier, but it's still hard. At least it helped prove uh, that intelligent media could handle streaming. So Ron was, Ron was uh, happy with that. So, Can I tell you that? Can I hear a secret? Here's a secret. Do you remember Promax? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know they're still around, but the the, the, the former guy that Charlie ran it, Charles McConaughey. Oh, I, I would say that uh, a big part of doing this was like Charlie wasn't doing it, so <laughs> we're going to do it. So <laughs> true. Exactly. So very true. <laughs> so, Mike, when did you join the show? Me? Yeah. Um, yeah we were, Philip and I were talking about that. I don't exactly remember the date, and I don't exactly remember why Philip asked me to do it. Well, and he said because nobody else would do it or something like that. <laughs> well, there was, there was and Steve Martin wouldn't do it, so it was like me or something. Was, well, Steve had moved out of the city by that time, well, too. Well, yeah, uh, Steve was like in Orange County. He hadn't yeah. moved to Arizona yet. No, yeah, but it was not, not convenient to where we were. Yeah, and, we were in Burbank. And, and Ron had already moved to Hawaii by that time and was starting his fairly successful career as a real estate agent. So we were doing the, the buzz uh, with laggy software. It was really uh, challenging at that point in time. And at uh, NAB 2005, we did a, a series of live shows from the show floor on the AJA booth, if I remember. And we just decided that was a natural time to wrap up that show. We took one week off, and then Greg and I started the digital production buzz. And my original plan was to have a rotating co-host. You may not know this, Michael. <laughs> well, that's what you said. <laughs> my, my original plan was to, to have two or three or maybe even four people who, so it wouldn't be too much of a burden on any one person. And so we got a little bit of diversity in the in the show. So and 
you at the end of the first show you said, well, I'll see you next week, and I thought... I did? Yeah, and I said, oh, OK, and that's... He just kept coming back. We've had the same problem. <laughs> Michael hasn't left this chair in a month. He just sits here, and we wake him up for the show. So, so really, I sort of like pushed myself oh, into no, this. Oh, not consciously. I mean, I, never dis I never discussed with you the fact that I had this plan for rotating co-hosts. You, you could have had Steve Martin. Well, Steve had moved to Arizona by then, I think. Well, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Steve, what was your most memorable uh, memory of doing the show? Was it an interview or a demo or the terror of doing live? Or what, what is it that sticks in your head after these years? Uh, I, the best thing that I remember is... Uh, we still had to do a show every week or whenever we, we were going to do it. And uh, I had my laptop. It was one of those black Mac, MacBook Pros. And I was going on vacation. It's like, well, we still got to do the show. So I brought my laptop with me to Carmel, which is up by near Monterey, Northern California. That's it's like, all right, um, I got to go do a show. So I had dinner. I got, you know, I popped a beer. And I literally, because it was noisy, I went into the closet. Wow. You know, and I hooked up my inter thing. And we interviewed Boris Yaminsky from... You know, and I was doing that from the closet at my vacation rental in Carmel. I just thought that was the coolest thing that in the world. That is the coolest thing playing. ever. I've actually done yeah. interviews, I think we have done interviews, with guys who had their laptop in their car and doing yeah. it via 4G. <laughs> oh, yes. Philip, how about you? What's the memory that sticks in your head of doing the show? Well, at this point, the one that comes to mind is, is Jerry Hoffman was... Uh, out in the snow, and we tried to do the one hour before the sh beforehand pre-call, and no, no Jerry, no cell phone service, and he got just back into cell phone service just in time to do the show <laughs> from his car on his cell phone on the way back down from the mountains where he'd been skiing all day. I mean, that's kind of like, oh, wow, technology. Oh, that's, the, like, amazing. The fact that we could we could drag into an NAB show in a, in a suitcase so we didn't run into any yeah. other issues, um, we could drag an entire production facility, a studio, audio. Incredible. But, you know, microphones, mixers, headsets, the whole works. It has changed. It has. It has, it has changed a lot. Steve, where can people go on the web to learn more about what you're up to? Uh, just uh, www.rippletraining.com. It even s sounds funny now to say www. Just say rippletraining.com. Yeah, exactly. That's where they can go. <laughs> and you can see Steve at uh, NAB at the... Uh, um, you, got, you guys are going to be giving demos and presentations at that uh, FCP exchange place, right? Yeah, I'm doing one on Monday and Mark's doing one on Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, so it's a little 30-minute session. They'll be there. And Steve Martin is the CEO of Ripple Training. Steve, thanks for joining us. Phil, if we want to have you hang around for the next segment, so we'll see you then. And we'll be right back after this. See you Ripple a couple Training. weeks at NAB. RippleTraining.com. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Still to come on The Buzz. Imagine Products has been specializing in workflow applications for over 25 years. They started with executive producer back in 1991, an all-in-one logging and offline editing tool. In 2006, ImageMind was used in the Salt Lake City Winter Olympics and ShotPut Pro was released. Today, there are more than 30,000 ShotPut Pro users worldwide. Pre-roll post for Macintosh was released in 2012. This is an LTFS archiving application compatible with any LTO tape drive, as well as Sony's ODA. Pre-roll post for Windows was released at the end of 2015. It's the only LTFS archiving application of its kind for less than $500. Imagine Products has three simple goals for its software. Make it powerful, make it easy to use, and make it affordable. It's easy to see why Imagine Products has been successful for 25 years. Imagine what comes next. Visit imagineproducts.com to download a demo. In this segment, we're going to take a look forward toward NEB in Las Vegas. However, we're going to do this a little differently. Uh, we've created our own roundtable of experts, starting with Ned Saltz. Ned is an author, an editor, an educator, and consultant on all things related to digital video. He's also a contributing editor for Creative Planet, a moderator on 2Pop and Creative Cow Forums, and best of all for us, a regular correspondent here on The Buzz. Hello, Ned. Welcome back. Hello, Larry, and good to be back. 
Oh, it's good to see you, and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. But just sit there for a second, because there's some more people I need to introduce. Next is sure. Philip Hodgetts. And Philip, as we introduced in the last session, is the CEO of Lumberjack Systems and a technologist in his own right. And Philip, good to have you with us. Thank you. Next to Philip is Michael Thomas. Michael is the Director of Technology at Keycode Media and consults on the latest in technology and best practices into the digital media communication space. And in his spare time, he's working on a series of web videos called Five Things, which may be up to six, maybe by now. We'll find out. Hello, Michael. Welcome. Hello. Good to see you all again. Good to have you back. But wait, there's one more to kick off our discussion on Me? NAB. No. Oh. To kick off our discussion on <laughs> NAB, earlier today, I asked Randy Altman to share her thoughts on what she was expecting for NAB. Randy? Well, I think you're going to be seeing a lot about VR, camera rigs, stitching software, from shoot to post is, is going to be big. And, and uh, in addition to that, I think there'll be a lot of drone stuff going on and, and maybe some conferences on how not to uh, hit an airplane or hurt people with it. But in addition to that, HDR is going to be big. And what I've been hearing and what I expect to see is that the people that are interested in HDR are sort of going to learn about the different standards and who is attacking which standard with their product. And they're not going to make necessarily any purchases right now because they want to be smart. They want to sit back and figure it out. But they want to learn as much as they can because there are people, multiple people working on standards for HDR, you know, including uh, those who are looking at it from a production or live broadcast perspective and those that are looking at it from a post-only perspective. So. It'll be interesting to see what manufacturers are, which one they're picking, and what workflow they're going to uh, target. I think those are good comments. Thank you, Randy. Philip, what do you think about Randy's thoughts? I'd say that she's absolutely spot on with um, with HDR, drones, and um, um, and virtual reality. These things are going to be the hot topics at this NAB. Um, I think. HDR is a very bright spot for NAB. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> that, was, that was a horrible pun. A horrible pun. It's an Aussie pun. <laughs> Ooh, we're talking about uh, Aussie puns. And, and if you right, if, right. Honestly, if you haven't seen HDR in action, if you haven't seen the high dynamic range screens, the high nit value, the high, really bright screens, then th you should absolutely go out of your way to make sure you see that at this NAB. Where do we see that? At Best Buy? Or can we see uh, that? Well, actually, Buy? you know, at, you can. If, the Vizio make an HDR set. Okay. Um, but at, at, you'll see a lot, at, at, obviously, at the Dolby booth at, at NAB. Ned, do you think it's HDR or is it the cameras that are going to have the focus? Oh, I think HDR is going to have the focus because we already have cameras that are, that are shooting high dynamic range. Uh, we have that uh, that capability in, in our editing and coloring software right now. And now the whole question is how do we uh, end up delivering that to the end user? And obviously, the end user is going to need an HDR receiver in order to in order to achieve that. And we're going to need uh, HDR monitoring devices in order to take full advantage of being able to to edit that to its uh, to its ultimate uh, advantage. Uh, like, for example, right now we're seeing the, the new uh, version of the Shogun and Atomos' uh, product that already uh, in their, their screens already are in, at least advertised to be an HDR screen. I haven't, I haven't seen one yet. So I think HDR is the biggest thing. We actually, think, we, go ahead, Mike. Did you see them last night? Did, did, did uh, Heather bring it? She did, yeah, yes. Yes, she, she did. did. Mm -hmm. Did you see it, and does it look HDR? Yeah. Yeah. It, it looks fantastic, yeah. Okay. yeah the, do you, do you think, Michael, I'll come to you in just a second. Sure. Ned, do you think there's going to be any camera news at all, or is it going to be pretty much the same old thing and they're going to focus on what the cameras create, which is the HDR signal? Well, I, I think we're probably going to see some cameras, but we've already seen uh, announcements, for example, in Panasonic with uh, the Vericam uh, LT. Sony already told us at our pre-NAB press conference uh, not to expect a replacement for the FS5 or FS7 or F5 or F55, but rather to see uh, firmware uh, firmware updates. I don't know what uh, JVC is, is going to come up with, but I think we're going to see uh, less in terms of radical new camera introduction uh, than we are going to see the technology kind of catching up to what those cameras are able to do. Michael, what do you think? Well, I'd agree with the majority of that. I think what the very interesting portion is going to be is um, high dynamic range, it's a very esoteric term, right? What defines high? 
right? So for camera manufacturers to say, hey, this is going to be high dynamic range, well, what defines high and whose definition of high? All the different manufacturers, uh, camera manufacturers now, have different standards. My understanding is that high dynamic range is defined as 10-bit video. Mm -hmm. And where you've got you've got more than 256 shades of gray or more than a thousand colors, is there another definition of high dynamic range? Well, sure. Uh, obviously, that's bit depth, right? But we're still talking about luminance values. And when we talk about how to view HDR, we're talking about nit count, right? And traditional televisions are a lower nit count, around 100 or so. Newer consumer televisions are upwards of a thousand. And I say upwards because they vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. So now we're stuck with getting cameras that can capture HDR, again, what range that is, and then being able to replicate that during distribution. So it's the wild, wild west. Philip? Uh, yes, that's pretty much the way I, I see it, except uh, it's not just high dynamic range, it's also a high uh, color, a very wide color space, mm -hmm. a wide gamut of color. So we have a, a completely different way of looking at an image. Instead of our brightest whites being at the highest level of the, of the 256 scale range, or 1024, or better, you know, we might set just normal white at two thirds of the way up so that we've got room to go up and get that glint off the window or glint sort of off the gun. Emphasizing <laughs> speculars. Yeah, uh, so that you, you actually have somewhere for the specular to actually hit you in the, in the eye with extra brightness. I'm kind of confused here. Is there no definition here? Is there no standards uh, well, here? Well, unfortunately, the great, <laughs> the great thing we, about standards. What are we talking about? The terrific thing is about standards is there are so many of them. <laughs> uh, Dolby have the, the so Dolby Vision is probably the most uh, well known, uh, and that's a full workflow from, from basically the acquisition so stage through grading through delivery. No there's, there's no SMPTE standards? There's a Dolby standard? There's sort of no. There's not at the moment. <laughs> the BBC have another way of... of uh, well, sim no, SMPTE has, has a standard. Dolby Vision oh, has SMPTE a standard. Has, BBC has oh, a sorry. standard. So there's there's at least three it's standards that I know yeah. of for HDR yeah. that are all defining it differently. We're just going to have an oxymoron. Three standards. Yeah, three standards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we've been through this many, yeah, many yeah, times. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be the difficulty in the production of the consumer sets because really until there is some kind of standard, we're going back to the old uh, VHS Betamax uh, <laughs> wars until something ultimately emerges as a, as a standard. Are there but, any but HDR monitors to actually no, look at? That's the, exactly the, the point that, I was going to bring up. And that, that's the expensive issue is that the tail's wagging the dog. Because uh, as Philip pointed out, you can go to your local consumer box store and buy a monitor that does, I don't want to use air quotes, but HDR. But if you try to view it in a critical viewing environment in your edit bay, in your finishing bay, the monitors are very expensive and very temperamental. And if exist. you can get them. <laughs> if you yeah, can who get said them. That? Well, there's, there's like a, two monitors well, in the, all of Los Angeles? There is a consumer, the ones at Warner Brothers? Yeah. There is a consumer standard called premium. Premium HD, a premium UHD, yeah. which is uh, the wide color gamut HDR signal 4K, which is now a brand which has been licensed to multiple but consumers. But what's the nit value on that? Pardon? What's the nit value on that? But what I'm saying is there's that name which defines it from yeah. a consumer point mm -hmm. of view. But you're right. So far, we don't have any good HDR monitors that we can use in post. We or don't have in... any, period. Well, there because is. They're, they're, like... at Dolby have a couple of monitors, but you can't buy those uh, monitors. You can only go to a facility see, that has one oh, of the monitors. That's what I think oh, okay. we're going to see at NAB. Yeah. I think we're going to see some monitors? HDR monitors. Wow. Nice. Panasonic and Sony have them both on the roadmap. It's just whether they're going to release them and whether you have to give up your firstborn. <laughs> and I, and I, although yeah. I love oh, sure. Trevor, you may have yeah. to give them up in order to get one of those I'd monitors. You're going to have to give up multiple generations of firstborn, actually. <laughs> 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 Let's shift gears out of HDR. Is there something else that's caught your eye, Ned, that uh, we should pay attention to at NAB? Say for I VR, think we say pay it. Attention to VR. I think we should pay, pay attention to VR. Good, it'll be you at know, the same Particularly Super now with this Nokia <laughs> device uh, that everybody seems to be uh, okay. touting. Uh, we'll probably see GoPro's uh, entry that they've been uh, that they've been touting. And, and we're seeing more and more... Um, uh, deliverables and and software are going along with it so i i think i think vr is going to be the next big kind of subtopic and and i see that as ultimately having more traction than 3d which i didn't believe when it came out a few years ago and i can now sit back and say <laughs> i told you so <laughs> but I, but I, I think vr vr is not 3d that's that's here to stay all right well let's shift over to michael because michael you made a good point that vr is actually a whole lot of different things so what is it well, just like HDR, there are uh, three different areas it falls into, right? You have the acquisition of VR 360, you have the editorial or post-production process of VR 360, and then you have the uh, exhibition, the consuming. Um, so, And we're going to see developments in each one of those uh, areas. Yeah. Uh, we're going to see cameras. We saw also a couple weeks ago over
Edward Alpha Dogs, right? We saw the uh, Jount camera, the which, jaunt, is, yeah, which, which is, is doing amazing. the stitching on 20, the fly. 24, 24 lenses. Yeah. yeah, doing the stitching on the fly. And I think we're also going to see, for, for all you Mac heads out there, the ability to actually do VR in post on the Mac. It's traditionally been PC for stitching, but we're now seeing the emergence of some software that can do it on the Mac side. Well, you have Tim Dashwood's plug-in, which does mm -hmm. it on Final Cut Pro 10 and Premiere, yeah. and then you have Metal, which also does it After Effects. Then there's Nuke. And uh, so everything is, is it, but you need some heavy, heavy iron. And oh, yeah. Unfortunately, the Macs are not considered heavy iron. <laughs> well, it's, it's not only just 360 and every direction, it's also high frame rate. I mean, I believe that the minimum standard is going to be 60 frames per second. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of the um, device just manufacturers are approving like 75 and 80. It's only above 72, 75 frames per second that we lose the perception of flicker. At that point, it starts to look solid and real to us. So we really do need to have high frame rate in there. And But again, it's a, it's yeah. what is, who's going to use this? I mean, I don't see the traditional Hollywood market or television going to VR, at least in, in the next couple of years. So what do you think the market is? Games, absolutely. Well, games, obviously. Experiences. That's CGI, though. Go, go. Experience, yeah. I think if we look at um, uh, museums, I think we look at those kind of one-on-one -on -one engagements where you want Medical to immerse yourself news. completely, yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah. Um, I think it's very difficult. I think uh, over at HPA this year, there was the, uh, someone was talking about VR and they said, uh, I haven't seen a good story. I've seen good yeah. concepts. That's yeah. what we're going to do. That was a great but way that's of what we're going to explore at the Super Meet. How how to how to tell or can you tell a compelling story in uh, VR in 360? We think you can, but nobody's cracked it yet. That's what's so much fun about the <laughs> world right now yeah. is that it, there are no rules. I mean, you're, you we are now just sort of making up the own rules. And so, what if somebody finds that rule? And if they're working on it right now, Doug Lyman, who's one of the great directors, is going to be doing a web or uh, no, a Netflix series uh, in VR. Mm -hmm. So it is a cinematic 360 series. So you're going to be telling a story in this stuff. So maybe he'll crack it. I don't know, or maybe not. So are drones now invisible? Are drones no. going to have? Any oh kind no, of no, drones will be drones will be huge. I mean, there's. It's so, such a flexible platform. There are so many ways that they can be used. You know what? And I don't even think you're going to need the nets anymore because now they have those little <laughs> sensors that, yeah. that it's not going to hit people and it's not going to hit each other and all that I, kind of stuff. Back in 2012, I was doing a, a, a show that it required me to learn to fly a drone. And I just saw on the company's board their, their um, roadmap for software. And I thought, why am I spending 45 minutes a day learning how to fly this, doing strange things in, my, in your head as to what's forward and backwards, what's <laughs> around? The software is going to do it all within a couple of years. Exactly. And yeah. that is exactly what's happened. Ned, but what's your thought have, on drones? The laws have to be worked out and they have to be consistent. So, for example, here, sitting here right over the GW Bridge from New York City and Bergen County, we can't fly a drone anywhere in Bergen yeah. County. Uh, you virtually can't fly a drone anywhere in New York City. Uh, so I'd have to go uh, way out to the country to do it. Uh, so the, the restrictive laws are certainly going to have to be dealt with uh, for this to be totally viable. But here in L.A., we're getting almost daily drones that are buzzing planes at LAX and causing near mid-air mid disasters. And, and I think that there has to be a balance between being allowed to fly a drone anywhere and hoping that you get on a plane and get back off again, isn't there? No. Oh, oh, of course, of, of, of course. The, that's, the, that's the problem. It accelerated too rapidly into a uh, too easily a consumer uh, accessible uh, device. And, uh, and so the, uh, the idiots take over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Michael, it's, if we don't think HDR and we don't think VR and we don't think drones, what should we look for at um, NAB? There's two things, and neither of them are sexy. I'm sorry. But one of them is asset management. <laughs> I, exactly. It's up there with Codex, right, Mike? Yeah. Um, but I, I like I to like, get, okay. a, get, a, get a close up of this. <laughs> I like to refer to it as automation because good yes. asset management isn't just tracking media and being able to retrieve it and find it when you need it, but also those automated tasks, whether it be transcoding, FTPing, sending emails. What spend your time creating as opposed to media mangling? Excuse me, media managing. Okay. <laughs> right. So media management. Media What's management? another one? That one is security. Right. There have been a lot of high level hacks at studios, but also, you know, uh, unscripted uh, reality shows. Right. Having uh, their systems hacked into or having dailies lost. And there's still the old, well, give the hard drive to a PA and fly him 
to where he's going so no one gets that footage. So being able to encrypt really? that footage, yeah. Wow. Being able no, to right. encrypt that footage uh, so no one else can get it um, is, a, is a huge issue. Okay, Michael, Philip, what, are, what are your top, what are your top, top hits that we haven't covered yet? Uh, Michael has all the sexy topics, so I'll have to go, <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to go to augmented reality. Which is oh, yeah, absolutely. quite different from VR, which is where you go into another space. Well, augmented reality is where that other space comes into the real world. So you look at a scene through a camera lens, usually on a phone, a smartphone of some kind, and extra information is overlaid onto that onto that image. So it might be you can do um, geolocated run. So you have to go to a certain point and then find. The, the bug or the what Easter egg. What did Microsoft egg? have? The hollow, um, uh, yeah. hollow the, the, yeah. that demo uh, was fantastic. You're dealing with Civil War battlefields yeah. where you can watch on an iPad and see the actual oh, battle. You, you know, you go up to you go up to the Eiffel Tower in um, in Paris, Las Vegas, not Paris, Texas, <laughs> and they give you an iPad. And anywhere on, on the top of the, the Paris Tower, you can look and see the view from yeah. the real Eiffel wow. Tower. Look up, look down, look That's around. Cool. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. Michael, what's your take for NAB? What have we not talked about that you want to mention quickly? Uh, no, he, he just brought it up, uh, augmented reality, which we hadn't talked about. So other than that, uh, I have nothing to say, Larry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ned, quickly, what's your quick take? What have we not mentioned that we need to talk about quick? Well, we haven't talked about lighting, and I think we're seeing tremendous advances in lighting over the past few years, and I hope we'll see that continual development to this year at NAB it, with uh, high CRIs, with, uh, with plasma, with uh, remote phosphor. I think there are a lot of advances in lighting technology. So LEDs well. will have the full spectrum of the uh, the light this year, or is it well, going to we'll be five years from now? It's Felix. A light like Felix, for example, you've got a full spectrum. Uh, you don't have any green spikes. You've got a very high quality LED. If you look at the pla you look at the uh, the remote phosphor lights, like from BBS or from Cineo, uh, you're seeing a very even uh, light with a, with a full spectrum. Um, and, and I think we'll see some announcements at NAB in that regard as well. Ned, I want to thank you so much. Ned Saltz is the contributing editor for Creative Planet Networks. His website is creativeplanetnetwork.com. Ned, as always, a delight chatting with you. Michael, thank you for joining Thanks, us. Ned. Pleasure. Director of Technology for Keycode Media at keycodemedia.com. Philip Hodgett, CEO of Intelligent Assistance. And Philip had said philiphodgetts.com, among other places. And Mike, you don't get to leave. We're going to talk with Serena Catania right after this. Oh, my gosh. Thanks. Thanks. Still to come on The Buzz. Serena Catania is the supervising producer of The Buzz, as well as a filmmaker, journalist, and former senior executive with United Artists and MGM. She's also one of the founders of the Sundance Film Festival, and today she's coming to us. I have no idea where yeah, Serena where is. is. We've got to find out. Hello, Serena. Where are you? Hi. <laughs> uh, Hello. I'm talking to you on my cell phone. Oh, from no. From the East Coast. From the East Coast. Are we talking, yes. are we talking Pennsylvania here or New York? Well, any moment, I think the White House helicopter that pro proposed, what is it, pro <gasps> patrols every night is going to come <laughs> right over my head. <laughs> so we're going to hear a helicopter any minute now. I closed the windows, but it doesn't help because it's pretty close. Serena, tonight we've been looking back and looking ahead, looking back at the start of the buzz and looking ahead at NAB. You've been with the buzz for almost nine years. What first got you interested in podcasting? Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, I started in radio many, many years ago when I was, what, 20 years old. I worked for AFN in Stuttgart. And um, so that's what got me started. I remember you sent me a photograph of you as a DJ. I, I still have that photograph framed on my desk. It's very cool. So but what was it, what was it that caught your ear about radio? Because television was still going strong then. What was it about audio only? 
Well, you know, one thing about audio is you can do anything with it. You could be anybody. You can bring anybody in. In the old days at AFN, we would be playing characters. And so every night we would walk in and somebody would have left us a recording uh, from the night shift. And it was always really fun. I'm still friends with a lot of those people. But podcasting, I remember being at the very first New Media Expo. How many years ago was that? I think podcasting started... Well, you covered it earlier in the show, but I remember the lunch that we had nine years ago when you said you were thinking about getting involved in podcasting and would I be interested? And I said, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I remember I that did, lunch yeah, very well. I remember well. the new media, new media expos. Yeah. That was like at uh, um, convention center in downtown L.A. Yeah. It was right? Even before it was, that, it even was, before remember, that, it was, you yeah. One and, go ahead, Tarina. No, I mean, I remember the very first year of the New Media Expo, it, we were tweeting for the first time. Twitter had just started. And there were maybe six or seven of us in the halls of the New Media Expo tweeting, and nobody knew what it was. <laughs> you know, Do you know when we started the buzz, uh, the Larry Jordan, when you started the Larry Jordan version of the buzz, DSLR cameras had just been invented. Yeah. Uh, to the shock of the of the video guys in Canon, if I remember correctly, because they didn't even know that camera was coming. Yeah. What yeah. Time, when was it, by the way? Was it 2006, 5, 6? We took over the show in November of 2007, so we're going on nine years. Right. Serena was but a child yeah. when first we started. I was. Uh, she was. I wish. She was a teenager. <laughs> she was I a teenager. Wish. A bobby soxer. Serena, you've been producing the show now for, for forever. What's the process of booking the show? How do you decide what guests to get? Wear your producer no, hat a, and explain how that process works. I think you have to be a bit of a futurist to know how to book the buzz. You have to be thinking ahead. I've, I've heard a little bit of the show, and we're all talking about what's going to be happening at NAB. But by the time it gets to NAB, it's already here. So... If we're going to be one step ahead of the industry, we need to be thinking about what's going to be happening at next year's NAB. So, Philip, I think Philip's uh, augmented reality discussion was really pertinent. I really, um, oh, but back to booking the buzz. I just think about what the future is going to be and go after it. And I'm really proud of the fact that over the last few years, we've done what, over 1,500 interviews, and almost 1,400 of those are new people that we're bringing in that had not been on the buzz before. So everything from covering <clears throat> fair use to copyright issues, uh, long before the general public was even really aware of it, we had our noses to the grindstone, and I think that's always fun. That's you, what makes it fun for do me. Do you have the stats on that? How many shows, how many guests, that kind of thing? 2,100 guests, 2,100, and more wow. than 445 shows. Wow. Which is pretty incredible. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. What, what, are some of, <laughs> what are some of your favorite bookings? What are your some of your favorite guests? You know, I love when we started talking about copyright issues before other people even knew about it because we could warn our independent filmmakers. But I also love new technology. I like talking about the cinematographers when they come in. Remember when we first started, nobody even knew what bokeh was. Um, so it's just, I can't think of any, but that's asking me who my favorite child is. <laughs> I can talk about issues. I think that um, cinematography and the growth and the new cinematography, the new cameras, the new lights, the new technology. Michael, your favorite thing with codecs have changed. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the legal issues. There have been some major legal issues. Remember when Ivy started and got kicked out and people have tried since? watching the different changes in distribution when Netflix first came about and Amazon and Hulu and talking to our filmmakers about how to best maximize their business. That's always really good. And when people write in and they say that you have made a difference in their lives in terms of being <clears throat> successful, that means a lot. So I guess those would be some of my favorite topics. Grant, uh, Grant on our live chat also says one of his favorite sessions was Larry's cable winding session, which yes. was a... One that Mike loved a great deal. <laughs> That's what you do at NAB. That's what. You, oh my gosh, you have to do that this year. You're going you're to be at NAB, and you have to do that. You have to do that like Thursday, right? I will do that Thursday. And, and put it out there. Have everybody come and watch you do it. And it's, I guarantee there'll be a thousand people. There. <laughs> everybody wants to see how you can roll a cable without having kinks in it. Anybody can roll a cable. 
but not to no, have kinks in it. No, not the way you do it. The it's real it's important, <laughs> right? You got to roll it right, or you're going to kink it, and you won't be able to use it. But you know, in the last nine years, we've also watched the NLE wars. Yeah. Between Avid and Premiere and Final Cut, and I think things are settling down now, and people are realizing that if you're going to be successful, you really need to know more than right. one. And that so. took a long time, and I don't think it's been fully settled in yet. Well, a lot of people preached it. It just took a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. NAB is less than three weeks away, and NAB is my favorite toy store. What, uh, what are you looking forward to this year? Uh, I really think that I, I spent a few hours on the Sony lot with Filmlight and Sony uh, a couple of weeks ago and looking at all the new HDR monitors that are out that the major studios are using um, color correction on those on those new monitors, and they're actually correcting now to 1,000 nits. Well, let's even wow. let's, though, yeah. Do you remember who so the monitors I, are made by? Yeah, who the monitors Sony. made? Sony. Really? really? Sony. Sony. Yes, yeah, Sony has some new monitors, so I'm thinking that they're going to be demoing those at NAB. And I know that it may be a little bit too early for us to think about HDR, but. Remember a few years ago when we were talking about HD and we were saying no, but I had gone to NAB and been in some meetings and I said, nope, if Sony's developing monitors for HD, then I know the whole industry is going to move towards that. So the major studios right now for films are, there are grading the features for standard def, high def, and also projecting to the future to 1,000. And they're also talking about eventually going to 4,000, but that's going to hurt our eyes. So uh, the contrast ratio in 4,000 is way too high. So I'm really looking forward to seeing more of those of the HDR products. And I think Philip's right on with augmented reality. I think it's a little bit too early for everyone to get involved in VR, but we're moving that way. But I think that for gaming, VR is already there. And um, I actually bought a couple of Google Cardboards to play with, and the Oculus Rift is fun. It's not like 3D, where you have to wear those silly glasses. So I do think, but Wait, I think in the area of VR, <laughs> yes, those silly goggles. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're gaming, those are really nice. Yes. And um, now they have the games where you're actually totally immersed and you're on treadmills. So not only are you seeing in 360, but you're feeling everything and running, literally physically running in 360. But I think one thing I'm looking forward to this NEB is to see what has happened since CES with 360 sound. Yeah. So sound, I think, is going to be important. We're going to be doing and that at the Super Meet, too, 360 sound. Oh, great. That's great. Now, we've talked so far, with the last session and this session, we've talked drones, we've talked VR, augmented reality, HDR. Is there a trend that we haven't mentioned that you're keeping your eye on that's maybe not hit mainstream but has got some intriguing potential? Oh, Philip's going to love this. It's metadata. It's the change in the way we use metadata. And I think not just in the you way we've been so talking depressing. about. <laughs> I know it's your favorite thing, Michael. Yeah, well, it's, think... it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Not just the way we use it in production and post-production, but also the way ultimately it's going to be needed for archiving. Because what is the use of archiving millions and millions of hours of footage if you can't find it, right? So I think that, that that's going to be a key. I also think that the new micro cameras, because of the proliferation of, of drones, the new micro cameras are kind of fun. There are going to be a lot of new micro cameras um, announced this year. But let me think what else. I think metadata and the way we handle that in, in production, of course, I'm a little prejudiced because of my involvement in Lumberjack, but I have seen the way that is changing a lot of the way people shoot. So are you working on any new projects right now? Well, I have three films in post-production. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, um, three films in post-production, one of which we discussed last year at Supermeet. It's the Chianti story film about the veteran, the Marine corporal who lost a leg in Afghanistan, and that's finally finished. Um, principal photography is wrapped on that. We're going into post. Well, that sounds wonderful. So, are are yeah. you yourself going to be able to make it to NAB? Am I going to be able to buy you dinner there? Yeah. Or are you, are you going to be there? Debating? I'm, I was going to try to stay home and work on the films, but I think I may leave the crew to do that and come visit at least for a little while. I it, hope you know, so. Michael, Michael so, just inherited a whole lot of money, so he's going to take you out to a very fancy dinner, just to let you know. Absolutely. <laughs> that sounds great. We are going, I think we, NAB, you, we are going to have steak. 
in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think NAB is really important for another reason, and that's the personal connection. Right. Yeah. And I think one thing that we're going to start seeing, too, is much more inclusion in our industry. A lot of the guilds are getting more and more involved in that, and I think there are going to be a lot of changes. And also, I don't know if we've discussed the new financial models yet, because distribution remains a constant in constant flux. So our financial models that we've been using for the last nine years are non-existent now. And the struggle between union and non-union, and Michael, I don't know if you agree with me, but I really do think there's going to be a shift more towards union because people are realizing that they need that brotherhood behind them to help support them in a way that uh, being out there by yourself as an independent doesn't often do. Well, it depends on our Supreme Court. Yeah. <laughs> Serena, what website can people go to keep track of what you're thinking about? They can go to filmvault.biz, or sorry, filmvault.us, or thecatanyagroup.com. Thecatanyagroup.com and Serena Catania herself. Serena, as always, a delight working with you. We'll chat with you again soon. See you in a few weeks, Thank Serena. You. Take, Take it out to Bye. NAB. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. It's time for a Buzz Flashback, five years ago today. It's an installation that engages different kinds of media. So it might be something that brings in sculpture with animation and then maybe a real-time interactive element. So it's, it's really something that's sort of activating a number of your senses. I think that we have an aesthetic that is looking towards the future. And a lot of the brands that we're working with want to do just that. They're trying to position themselves for the years to come. This was a Buzz Flashback. The buzz has always responded to changes in our industry, and now changes are coming to the buzz. Our program is moving to new owners and to a new format. Starting next week, the buzz is partnering with Thalo.com and Doddleme.com to provide a more comprehensive look at our industry from the perspective of both filmmaking and film viewing. Thalo.com is an online resource for creative individuals which covers everything from fine arts to performing arts to filmmaking and everything in between. While Doddle Me is a leading online resource for the video and film industry. Doddle is the perfect partner for the buzz and we're excited to be adding another perspective and dimension to our show. With this new partnership, the show itself will be changing. For now, we're returning to our roots as an audio-only podcast. The show will still be live, still every Thursday, and still posted to iTunes and the Buzz website. But we need to think more about the best way to use video for the show, so this switch allows us time to rethink and revise. I'm also delighted to announce that both Mike and I will be staying with the show. Plus, because of our new partnership, we're able to extend our resources to include the Thalo and Doddle teams. This allows the buzz to increase its coverage and focus on the media industry, providing news and interviews with the people that make media possible. Also, for the eighth straight year, the buzz is heading back to NAB. During the four days of the trade show, we'll originate 13 live shows, interviewing more than 50 industry leaders to help you keep up with all the latest announcements at the show. You can learn more at nabshowbuzz.com, which will be updated next week with a show schedule and a guest list. On a personal note, the buzz has been an amazing experience for me for the last nine years as both the executive producer and the host. <clears throat> the buzz team has created more than 500 shows, interviewed more than 2,100 guests, and covered our industry more thoroughly than any other podcast on the planet. I'm very proud of that record and proud of the team that put it together, starting with Serena Catania. Serena is the heart of the buzz. Her energy, enthusiasm, and insight have discovered guests and trends long before they reached market consciousness. I'm deeply grateful for all of her hard work, and I'm very proud of the technical team behind the scenes. We've had a lot of people working on the show over the years. A lot of students found it a great way to discover how broadcast media actually works, but there are four people I need to mention by name. Debbie Price, 
Brianna Murphy, Adrian Price, and Megan Paulos. Without their help, this show would not exist. As I said at the beginning, this is a time of change both for us in the industry and for the buzz itself. Our new partnership provides exciting new potential with many very cool ideas in the planning stage, and I'm looking forward to sharing them with you in the time to come. And through it all, the buzz will be here to help you make sense of this wild, crazy, constantly changing industry that we're in. And I look forward to talking with you next week on The Buzz. And I'll see you at NAB. You know, Mike, change is coming, but I'm glad to have you with us. I got a cheer in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That was, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the thing I like about it is, is that... Uh, we're switching to something a little bit different, but the team stays the same. That's right. You don't have to look at this face anymore. No, you have a... But you can hear this wonderful, melodious voice. You have voice. a perfect face for radio, Michael. Exactly. You know Thank that. you very much, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled because this has been a tough few weeks, a uh, few weeks, few months. Mm. And True for enough. me and you, but especially you. And I'm very, very proud of what you've done. And I'm very, very proud of being a part of this. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us. It makes okay. all the difference. Thank you. I want to thank our guests for this evening. Steve Martin, the CEO of Ripple Training. Philip Hodgetts, the CEO of Lumberjack System. Michael Thomas, the Director of Technology for Keycode Media. Ned Saltz, Contributing Editor for Creative Plan Networks. Randy Altman, the Editor-in-Chief at PostPerspective.com and Serena Catania, the supervising producer for The Buzz. There's a lot of history in our industry, and it's all posted to our website at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Here you'll find thousands of interviews all online and all available to you today. And remember to sign up for our free weekly show newsletter that comes out every Friday. You can talk with us on Twitter at DPBuzz and Facebook at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Our theme music is composed by Nathan Doogie Turner with additional music provided by smartsound.com. Text transcripts are provided by Take One Transcription. Visit takeone.tv to learn how they can help you. And one of the cool things about transcriptions is it makes it really easy to find the highlights of the show, like Mike's jokes. Our <laughs> supervising producer is Serena Catania. Our show producer is Debbie Price. Our production team is led by Brianna Murphy and includes Ed Golia, James Miller and Debbie Price. On behalf of Mike Horton, my name is Larry Jordan, and we are delighted to always have you watch and listen to The Buzz. Thanks for joining us this evening. Goodbye, everybody. Take care. The digital production buzz was brought to you by Otherworld Computing, providing quality hardware solutions and extensive technical support to the worldwide computer industry since 1988. And by ImaginProducts.com, specializing in workflow applications for over 25 years. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. To stay connected and receive updates from the buzz, sign up for our free weekly newsletter now. Or you can learn more about us on our website. And thanks for watching the Digital Production Buzz.